good day. Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. For those of you watching it live today, uh, it is Valentine's Day, so be sure to knock the dust off those personal trimmers. And guys, be courteous, drink a little uh, pineapple juice. And if it's past and you're watching this on one of the cable channels, well, I hope you had a good Valentine's Day all the same. Got a good show lined up. As always, boy, the issues are just piling up. Uh, for, again, for those live, hey, use that comment scroll. It's it's good. To, I like seeing that interaction. Let's just stay civil with each other. I see Matthew Duffy getting ahead of things, saying, Steve, the CBC and Catherine Tate, CEO. Absolutely. I'm with you there. And uh, others checking in, Mr. Stanley, Wild Rose, Scott Campbell, Jordan. Thanks for joining. Get in there. Put those comments in. Just uh, stay civil with each other. We don't always have to be at each other's throats, which is something I'm looking forward to with my guest, too. He's going to come on in a little while. Transgender columnist Julia Malott. And, uh, yeah, you know, we seem to have a lot of trouble having civil, rational conversation when it comes to trans issues. They're sensitive ones, but she really, uh, you know, we don't always all agree on everything at the same time, but we can talk about these things without being at each other's throats it's it's we don't have to be on the fringes all the time i think there is some middle ground to be found so i'm looking forward to that conversation it's going to be a, a, an interesting one she's she's very uh, interesting to listen to all right let's get on to what uh, i want to, to get on about today and yes it's media and legacy media as usual i'm going to go back in time a bit for those who remember the 80s and late 70s if you remember the buggles they released a hit signal single and this is an earworm this one and you know video killed the radio star if you remember it that was nearly 45 years ago. And that song bemoaned the end of radio-based stardom for musicians because media, music videos were hitting the scene. Well, it's getting near half a century since that song came out. And music-based radio stations, they're starting to fade away, but it took until now. And it's not video that's taking them out. It's streaming music options like Spotify that led to the change. And the stars aren't gone. They've just moved on to a new platform. I mean, even if every radio station was to shut down today... Like her hater, Taylor Swift would remain a household name and would pack stadiums for her shows. Things have just changed, that's all. Musicians in the early 1980s who weren't willing to embrace videos, well, they were often left behind, especially once NTV became huge. So artists, though willing to change with the times, found videos provided a whole new platform to reach audiences. So rather than whining that video killed the radio stars, they actually found a new way to make money, and they did very well with it. Every technological change brings out people claiming it's going to wipe out jobs or destroy an industry. Now, while tech-inspired transitions can be disruptive and harmful, if, uh, if uh, an inflexible market is out there, you know, but products, industries, they evolve, and jobs remain for those willing to do things differently. I mean, myself, I used to work as a surveyor in oil exploration. I've been trained in using a transit and a theodolite. GPS made that mode of surveying pretty much obsolete, and I had the choice to adapt or lose my job. Well, I adapted. Mechanized agricultural practices. I mean, they did put millions of farm, farm laborers out of work. Remember the Jode family and Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath? They were initially displaced because of new tractors working the cotton fields. But while new agricultural technology caused a lot of social and economic upheaval for a time, should governments have tried to block the evolution or subsidize people to plant and harvest crops by hand? Technological advances uh, have since increased agricultural production to the point where famine is rare in a world with 8 billion people in it. And the evolution caused pain, but it was worthwhile in the long run, and labor balanced itself out as people learned and embraced new skills. Now getting back to the arts, stage performers, I mean, they feared moving pictures would wipe out their industry back at the turn of the 20th century, the start of it. Broadway's still going strong today. Movie stars, they feared television would wipe out their industry. Well, movies and the stars associated with them are still doing quite fine. Artists willing to flex were actually provided with a broader spectrum of performance options. Netflix. They began as a movie rental company. Actually, they delivered DVDs. Then they started a streaming service. Blockbuster, though, they were a movie rental company and they stuck to their guns. Well, Blockbuster went from an industry giant to oblivion. And Netflix is now worth an estimated $240 billion. Changes can hurt and the transition periods can be messy, but the change is inevitable. People need to adapt to change rather than try to fight it. Or worse, People have to could try getting the government to fight the change on their behalf. And that brings us to the state of today's news media. Uh, conventional news media has been in a state of steady decline for nearly 20 years now. The collapse of the industry has been accelerating, and the recent spate of layoffs in Canada by CTV sort of drove that point home. But instead of seeking rational ways to facilitate the transition of an industry in flux, Trudeau had a temper tantrum during a news conference, and he declared, I'm pissed off. At what? How? How long does Trudeau expect a business to continue without a viable business model? Of course, it's a bit much to expect Trudeau to understand even the most basic of business or economic principles. If he hasn't caught a glimmer or sense to those issues, you know, by now, he's, he's not gonna. 
Trudeau's government's been pumping incentives and direct subsidies into leg- legacy media outlets for years, and it's failing. I mean, ostensibly, they're doing it to save an industry too, deemed too important to fail. In reality, of course, he's more motivated in buying the love of media for his embattled regime. And he has bought a little bit of love. I mean, they're certainly holding the leader of the official opposition to account. But media outlets can't afford to operate under those outdated models. The layoffs and closures are going to continue. If anything, Trudeau's handouts to media outlets have made things worse. Legacy media outlets, they've quickly become dependent upon subsidies rather than looking at ways to adapt to changing times. And Trudeau tried a failed cash grab on social media giants like Facebook. And not only did it fail to garner any money, but it took away a means of drawing traffic to media sites, causing them all, whether large or small, to lose revenue. Yeah, he made it worse. Outlets counting on checks from Facebook, yeah, they're suddenly realizing that money isn't coming. And now they're starting to cut. Look, guys, print newspapers, they're not coming back to where they were again. People aren't going to pay for classified ads again. Families aren't going to gather around the TV to watch the evening news anymore. Those days are gone. The market isn't gone, though. It's just diluted. And people have so many new means to seek entertainment and information. We just don't need some of the services news outlets are trying to provide. They need to change. They need to flex. I can find the weather forecast for my area or anywhere else in the world within seconds on my phone. So why are TV stations still bothering with meteorologists on staff? That's just one example. I can go directly to websites to find information that I used to have to get from newspapers and broadcast outlets. Now, people still want to read, view, and listen to news and opinion, and they're willing to spend money to do so, as the Western Standards subscription model is proving. But the outlets need to be lean, targeted, and efficient now. No more giant buildings, no large studios, and no printing presses. As with every other industry, the news media will adapt to a working model though many outlets are going to fall by the wayside during the transition. Subsidizing existing outlets is doing little more than animating a corpse at this point. As with most things, all the government needs to do with media is just get out of the bloody way. It's going to take care of itself. That's unfortunately contrary to the authoritarian nature, though, of the Trudeau regime. Let's hope the next administration knows how to back off. Okay, that's where I was going today, guys. Yeah, just that that conference at Trudeau was just too much. I mean, I'm sad about the layoffs. I really am. I don't like seeing lost jobs, but we got to get real, guys. All right, let's bring in our news editor, Dave Naylor, and see what else is going on out there. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Uh, good day, Corey. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Oh, thanks. Uh, you didn't give me a card or anything, though. Oh, man. Uh, you got anything planned for Jane uh, tonight? Uh, I, well, I'm probably going to have to now. Ha! You're an old romantic, aren't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we've had a really busy morning uh, in the newsroom, Corey. It's all sparked by uh, uh, Sean Polzer's story yesterday of... Uh, uh, wacky Environment Minister uh, uh, Gil Bow saying that uh, they're done spending money on uh, roads and, uh, you know, basically wants everybody to walk. Well, the uh, the story uh, took took fire and was retweeted by Premier Daniel Smith and uh, and Premier uh, Scott Moe and Premier Doug Ford was uh, commenting uh, on it this morning. Uh, uh, so this country's in a bit of an uproar uh, or over uh, over the story. So, uh and he's, uh, I think he uh, backed off a little bit today. Uh, I know our uh, Sean Polzer was uh, just uh, at a press conference with Premier Smith and uh, asked her about it. So that uh, that story will be coming up uh, uh, very quickly. We got some breaking news leading the site at the moment, uh, Corey, at uh, Tamara Leach, along with various other uh, Freedom Convoy uh, organizers, have uh, launched a lawsuit against Justin Trudeau and uh, uh, the federal liberals over the way they were treated and uh, uh, you know, freezing everybody's uh, bank accounts. Uh, it was a two-year anniversary of that uh, today, and uh, on that day, uh, Leach and others uh, filed her lawsuit. Uh, we got uh, lots of Alberta versus Ottawa stuff today, including Rebecca Schultz uh, uh, sending off a nasty uh, Valentine's Day letter to uh, the aforementioned Mr. Gilbo on uh, his comments on methane reductions. And then we've got Alberta intervening against uh, the Trudeau uh, uh, gun bill and specifically their uh, their vow to uh, ban, uh, quote, assault style uh, weapons, uh, unquote. Uh, we got uh, Linda Slobodian is talking about the uh, increased immigration rates that the, the Trudeau uh, uh, government uh, is uh, bringing in. And uh, basically, if you've got a spare bedroom, you may be asked uh, uh, to, to house, a, house a migrant. Uh, the uh, Alberta government in, um, unveiled an ambitious new uh, tourism plan today that they hope by 2035 annual spending by tourists in the province will hit uh, $25 billion a year. 
And we've got a newly released uh, Privy Council report uh, saying that Canadians do not trust uh, Trudeau and Gilbo on their climate change plan. So uh, I think it's a bit like uh, stating the bleeding obvious, Corey, but uh, you get the feeling that uh, Canadians are almost at the end of their rope with this kind of uh, nonsense. I think they really are, but we still got such a long rope ahead of us to try and uh, get rid of the government in power. It's going to be a long couple of years yet, I'm afraid. Yeah, but it's, you know, the, t- the clock is ticking and we're now, uh, we're now less than two years away. True enough. Well, we'll keep working on it. And it gives us lots to uh, write about and lots for me to rant about, I guess, so we can look on that bright side. Uh, true enough. So don't forget to pick up some uh, flowers from 7-Eleven on the way home. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. All right. Thanks for the update, Dave. I'll talk to you later. Thanks, Corey. You know, advantages I do have in having a live show, though, I'll take advantage of my platform. And I will say outright, yes, I'm being cheap. Using what I've got, though, and it's true. Jane, if you're listening today, I love you, and I'm lucky to have you, and I know it. I don't say it often enough, but uh, this is the day to remind us to kind of think about that and uh, know when we've got it good. So uh, thanks for putting up with me for this long, and I'll see what I can find at 7-Eleven. All right, but yes, lots going on out there in the news, and uh, our newsroom is busy and running hard as always. So uh, this is thanks to you guys. That's what I talked a little bit about the media changes and fluxes where a subscription-based outlet there's some advertising but subscriptions are really what's important to us and for $9.99 a month $100 a year you can subscribe get past the paywall and it helps keep us independent and providing this sort of news Jonathan Bradley he's up in Edmonton he's going to be reporting all of those things for us uh, on the legislative front and we've got people across the country providing columns and news copy to us if you haven't subscribed yet Please do, guys. We really appreciate it. It's not that much. And if you've already subscribed, I really do appreciate it. Thank you for getting on board. So, yeah, let's see uh, uh, what else we've got going on. I mean, as Dave said, you know, in in, in reporting on the obvious, there's little trust in Gilbo's leadership. I mean, the the environmental front has really gone mad in in so many ways. We've let the the extreme at least dominate the the discourse i don't think he's winning but he's really causing a lot of disruption gil Bo, when he's hinting at basically the federal government's cutting you know pushing into municipalities to keep them from building roads because uh, they don't want us to drive anymore it, it's 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 crazy and this you know crazy from an environmentalist is nothing new but when it's the top environmentalist in the country when it's our environment minister we should be uh, pretty concerned guys this is problematic Uh, Likewise, I mean, he's not in government, but with the NDP, with that private member's bill, talking about making it illegal to essentially speak positively about the oil field, I mean, it's not going to happen. The bill's not going to pass. It's private members and it's loony. But just the fact that he thought he could put that in there, and, you know, it's taking up the time of our our news and our discussion and and our parliament is is just astounding. The environmentalists have, have really gone I don't know, off the rails. So, you know, I'm going to use that to segue into my next guest, which I want to speak about. I mean, we're going to talk about something I think has been more polarizing and more sensitive than the environment. And it it needs more than anything, some rational discussion, because we do have people on the fringes. Those are the ones that make good news copy. Those are the ones that make the most fun for us to tweet at or retweet or or do those sorts of things. But it doesn't lead to productive ends. You know, we, we have some activists on both sides that really just heat things up. And uh, we don't get any progress, though, when we do that, as fun as it may seem and as much as it makes for good online traffic. So uh, I've got uh, columnist uh, Julia Malat on, and, and she is transgender, and she speaks openly of those things. And I, I just really enjoy her videos and, uh, you know, speaking of political issues in general and on the, yes, the trans issue, because it, it's just been such a big one the last couple of years. So uh, welcome to the show, Julia. I appreciate you coming on to talk to us today. Thanks for having me. So I, I saw one of your recent uh, videos, actually, you were down in the, the United States, or are you still down there right now? Or? I am in Florida right now. This is This is my rental house. Okay, right on. And I, I liked where you went with that because what you know that was something I experienced when I was working in Texas, and I love getting down to Texas whenever I can. Is yes, some people can be uh, oh, the other next are truly as red as they get down there, but at least they're blunt speaking. They can have the discussions. Our own Canadian politeness and our disinclination to get into issues that might be controversial actually again sort of hinders us. You had a, a great uh, dis- discussion with a person in, in a Target store. You were saying. 
I did. I did. So I come down here pretty regularly. Um, I really enjoy the conversations that I have down in the American South. And yesterday I was at Target uh, picking up some salsa and the woman beside me, she started talking to me about Jesus. And then we quickly went on to trans matters and it ended up being maybe a half an hour conversation. And things were said that might be considered you know, politically incorrect in terms of how the topic was handled. But I love that. I love that we can have the chance to authentically connect and that people down here feel comfortable just sharing their mind. Well, yeah. I mean, we're not going to get anywhere if we just don't talk. And, uh, you know, this issue is here. It's front and center. It's it's big. And, and we've seen it really hit the news lately with, with Premier Daniel Smith laying out at least, uh, I mean, the legislation isn't there, but what she feels sh should be the appropriate uh, uh, restrictions and legislations, particularly regarding minors. I mean, I, I think that's kind of one of the areas where things have really brought it to a head. I mean, people, when it's adults, uh, you know, they might disagree, but they're not too concerned, but they get very concerned when it comes to minors. And we do treat minors differently than we do with adults when it comes to choices that they make. But at the same time, minors do need protection because we not every parent is, is supportive. Where, I guess, you know, it's a big question, so it'll probably be a bit of an answer. And you've talked a bit about it. Where do you think Premier Smith landed in trying to find the balance there? It's hard to comment in, in one comment because there's so many different pieces to the legislation. There's pieces that touch social transition. So that's going to be names and pronouns in school and whether that should be allowed without parental consent. There's the sex education piece, but then there's also the, the uh, medical side, the surgical and hormonal interventions for minors. And then there's the sports piece too. So we've seen the social transition conversation before in Saskatchewan and New Brunswick, but we really haven't seen the other conversations hit the Canadian policy level until it arose in Alberta two weeks ago. Yeah. So, I mean, when it comes to children, something that comes up and people feel sensitive about it quickly, I, I think no matter where they land on is parental rights though. And it seems there's an... Uh, an assumption on the part that parents just shouldn't be trusted with all the information on their children and, and that the schools should act as gatekeepers from that from them. And I think even trans supportive parents just feel a bit offended, like, hey, hang on a second. I, I am the one who should be communicating with my child in, in these important times, not, not uh, being held uh, out of the conversation by a school. And I, I think that's where the big battle is going to be drawn here. I, I agree with that. Um, there is an attitude among some people that this is not a big deal. This is a name and it's a pronoun. And so we don't need to have parents involved. And yet, at the same time, they use an argument that we shouldn't tell parents because, well, what if the parents are cause abuse and what if they cause harm when this happens? And having been through a transition myself, I would say this is a big deal. It can be profoundly positive, but it also can be profoundly negative. And so for a school to undertake this with well-meaning intention to support a child, that's that's not a good thing. This is something that we want the medical community to be standing by the child to provide psychiatric support. We certainly want the parents to be involved to make sure that we understand how this is going to relate to the family. And that isn't what's happening. So, so that piece of the policy, I certainly think is prudent. There's always some discussion amongst people whether this should be um, consent on behalf of the parents or whether parents should be informed this is happening. I, I think there's fair debate to be had on that. But the status quo in many schools in Canada right now is that parents are just not part of the process at all. Yeah, well, and you called out some stuff when it comes to, again, I think most people at least are uncomfortable with the thought of irreversible surgeries being done to anybody who's under 18, because we know that decisions come and go and there's, there's confusion, there's flux. Uh, but you did point out that Nobody's been calling out, you know, breast augmentation for, for girls under 18, even though, you know, if it's a non-gender issue, uh, people weren't saying anything or even boys getting reductions. I mean, these are surgical procedures that are elective and ostensibly could wait until after 18 years uh, as well. And of course, Premier Smith didn't mention that at all. That's just it. I'm personally a proponent of waiting on surgeries because surgeries, of course, can have lots of complications and they are irreversible. So there can be an element of regret even if you're very confident when you're younger. And there isn't a lot of reason to move forward when you're young. People might want it for affirmation and I can appreciate that, but how is that different than other affirmation surgeries? People are doing this when they're not transgender for because they want a smaller nose, because they want breast augmentation and they, they all have these risks, they all have these complications. So I think a stronger policy would be one that treats them all the same way, that says, if we're comfortable with minors doing this, so be it. I'm perfectly would I would rather see us not have minors having those surgeries and wait until people are adults. Yeah, well, and here's where I guess a lot of the 
confusion comes along for a lot of us. That's why I appreciate you, you being frank and talking about these. I get the opportunity to ask you. I mean, I, I you know, as, as everybody else, I grew up, I went through puberty. It was a crazed hormonal time, but, but you know, a lot of confusion, insecurity, and all that good stuff that came with it. But I was always confidently straight. I was with the majority. It was pretty straightforward. I didn't have to wonder whether I was into this or that. I was just always wondering how I could get into that. Uh, but where, in your case, for example, did you start to feel you were confident that you were a trans person? Like, that's where a lot of people are, are confused. We haven't had to experience it, so we don't know. Uh, does it, is it really that confident a, a thing that happens, or does it evolve over time? What, what was your experience? I think one of the most complicated things about the current discourse on transgender matters is that there are two different things happening at once. One of them is what we would classically call gender dysphoria, and that's the individual who has a deep set, you know, severely debilitating feeling that they're not the sex that they are and or that they are the sex that they are, but that it simply doesn't work and that they can't maneuver themselves through society based on the expectations that we place upon the biological sexes. And that was me. I have always felt this way. When I was really young, of course, I didn't have the language for it because this wasn't talked about when I was a little kid. But being so dysphoric, everyone knew that my life wasn't working. I had four different counselors before grade six to try to figure out why does Jason have no friends? Why does Jason not connect with the boys? It was, it was obvious something was happening. And I found the answer myself when I was 11, even though this was not in the school and this was not in the healthcare system because I was desperate and I was looking for things online to even explain why I, I was so different and why I wanted these things that other people didn't seem to want. That's always existed, but that is not the same thing as what we see now in many other cases, which is being transgender has become an identity. It has a flag. So you can also land in that crowd because it gives you a community. It gives you a purpose. It gives you something to latch onto. And I'm not here to say if that's right or wrong. People can have whatever identity they want to have, but that's not the same thing. And when we end up having surgical and hormonal interventions that are not being kind of carefully watched to make sure that they're only the right individuals are taking them on at the right time, we have seen people who end up heading down these pathways and end up afterwards, we find out they had comorbidities or other factors that led to it and they have regret. Well, yes. And, and, uh, you know, there, there are truly trans people, uh, you know, and they, they've been born that way. We can, you know, go on until the end of time as to why or how. But as, as we're seeing today, we, we also see children going to flux. You say some might identify because I mean, we can't tell the difference. So they could be identifying as such because they're seeking attention or perhaps for a period of time they do feel that way, but it's passing. And that's, again, where the big fear of doing anything irreversible comes into the picture and, you know, if, if they've settled it by 18, I think most people aren't terribly concerned, but they, we really worry when we start meddling, whether chemically or surgically, with somebody's growth, because, I mean, there could be some serious consequences. Yeah, you're completely right that there are consequences. And what I like to remind people is that on the surgery side, it's pretty safe to wait. On the hormone side, there's consequences either way, because if you transition young by going on puberty blockers, then you've affected your pathway and you're going to have implications on your sex life and on your ability to, to reproduce later on. So we want to do, we don't want to do that lightly. At the same time, if you don't end up transitioning young and you want to transition as an adult like I did, you're not going to pass. Pass is a word that's used in the transgender community to refer to being able to convince the world that you're the sex that you identify as. And people can tell my voice is lower. There's certain facial elements here that kind of sends the signal I'm biologically male. And the, the reality is the world is not always kind to people who don't blend in as one sex or the other in you know the stereotypes that we associate with it. And so that's also part of this equation. And I think what's missing in a lot of the conversation is that recognition that the kids who are deeply dysphoric, they're, they're latching on to these surgery or not the surgery so much, but the hormones at a young age, because they know that that is their door. That's their window to be able to achieve passability and just blend in and live the life that they want. And to close that door entirely, to not allow parents to even opt their kids in when parents and doctors feel this is the right fit for a given child, that's a pretty, that's a pretty hard line position to take in and of itself. Well, and I mean, we're, we're, we, people make a lot of assumptions too. I mean, a, a child is worried about uh, speaking with the parents about these, these changes or where they may want to go. It may turn out that the parents were actually very supportive. I mean, your children, you're insecure, you worry about things. And I mean, I'm certain that, uh, that these sorts of issues would be much better coped with with the participation of your family and your parents as opposed to keeping it a secret for a long time, which makes you 
garner a sense that it's something shameful. And that's precisely what I advocate for. I, we've had periods in the past where it was very difficult to transition, where it was sort of what we would be called um, safeguarded so that trans people can't easily get to it unless the doctors allow them to. And that was a problem sometimes, but then we swung the other way and said, it is self-ID. It is however you feel is correct. We will affirm that. We will never look for any other comorbidities that might be leading into it. And we will just let you lead the charge. And that can be dangerous for anybody, but especially for a child, that can be a dangerous pathway. I would like to see nuance where we bring parents, we bring doctors along, and on a case-by-case -case basis, we really say, is this the right fit? In a case like mine, where things are showing up at six years old, by 12, 13, maybe I am an okay fit for hormones, and that's probably not a huge risk, but that's not every case. There's lots of other cases that have different comorbidities that play into it. Yeah, and, and again, things change over time. I mean, something in general that changes over time, lower societal attitudes, I, I think we're getting better. Uh, you know, I, I tweeted that you were coming on uh, the, the show yesterday and a, and a few jerks popped into the mix as usual. And then you're always going to deal with that. But if, I, if Twitter existed 30 years ago and we even broached this discussion, it, it would have been bananas. I mean, 30 years ago, even liberals were saying that uh, gay marriage should still remain banned. I mean, the, the society has, has become much more accepting. This is, I, I think, perhaps one of the last bastions now of just learning to accept people to be different. I don't know if it's the last or not. I, I've never really thought about what comes next in other domains. Um, I think we're far from done seeing the, the culture battle on this particular one. I think it's just heating up and we're going to see more of it based on some of the conversations that are happening in the States who's tended to be about 12 to 18 months ahead of us on this matter. So I expect we're going to see this at 2024 and 2025 in Canada. I also don't think that's a bad thing because for a long time we haven't been having this conversation and I think that builds up the tension and I'm happy that now we have politicians who are talking about it, who are having these conversations so that we can hopefully land on something that is moderate, that really does consider the needs of the gender dysphoric, but also considers the needs of the other intersections of society too, making sure that parents are involved, making sure that the rights of other individuals are not encroached upon. And I believe that there's a path forward. So, as you said, I mean, there's a lot to unpack. We only have enough, you know, there's never enough time for something this big. But one of the, the final aspects of what Premier Smith was talking about was uh, when it comes to sports, now how enforceable or how much we want government getting into things like sports organizations is another debate altogether as well. But that's where the public has seen, I think, some of the absurdities. I mean, where we're being asked to accept uh, something that's getting a little too far outside. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's a trans person that blew the, the woman's powerlifting record out off the, the, the charts, you know, and, and, and some other sports that are so inherently physical. I mean, we can't pretend there isn't an advantage for, for some of the biologically born male individuals in that. And, and it's not unreasonable to try and accommodate trans athletes while protecting the, the, the women's sports, is it? I, I really like the sports conversation because I think it highlights how nuance needs to be applied to these conversations. The, the most famous case is Riley Gaines and Leah Thomas. This was professional swimming down in the States in 2021, I believe. And that was unfair. That was kind of ridiculous that a biological male could win the trophy. And we have seen more and more cases like that. And I think a lot of people sense the inherent unfairness in those circumstances. That being said, that's not the same thing as a grade seven volleyball intramural league, where it's more about camaraderie and teamwork than it is about being the strongest, best volleyball player. And so I would like to see nuance come into that conversation too. I think that in cases where it is about the competition, fair enough, there, there could be biological imperatives that play in. But as a child who ended up feeling alienated because I couldn't play with my friends who were all girls because... I didn't have the right genitals. Well, that does increase dysphoria. And I, I'm not sure that that's appropriate at that amateur educational level either. Yeah, and I think Premier Smith sort of, uh, you know, alluded to some degree of that and saying, you know, you don't, don't want to take trans people out of sport altogether because it's, it's something everybody enjoys and when they, you would be excluding. But we just have to have that discussion on where it's most appropriate and where it isn't, which I, I think you sort of covered. And I appreciate that. It's just unfortunate when we see those extreme examples, as you said, with the swimming and that, and that's what, uh, ends up over filtering into the rest of the conversation on trans issues in general, which aren't necessarily bringing things to such extremes. So, I mean, we have to address them all, but but the, some are a little more clear cut than others, I think. Definitely. No, I'm looking forward to the continued conversations. I'm unclear on exactly well, Albert, where Alberta is going to land when it comes to the sports piece. Um, but I think it's an important conversation to have. I'm just hoping that the path forward is still inclusive 
does still create opportunities for people and, and makes us question, when is sex segregation important? When is it useful to society? And when is it maybe a relic of eras gone past that we should be letting go of? And I think in a lot of these sex debates, that can help us to kind of work through how to proceed in a way that has some staying power for the future. Well, I really appreciate your your frank discussion with us on this and, and the uh, discussions you've been having online in general. I, before I let you go, where can people find uh, where, you know where you put your stuff out there? So I am on Twitter, or X as we call it these days, uh, under Alada Malata, which is very hard to spell. But if you search Julia Malad, you'll find me there as well. I also write a weekly column for the National Post. And I have stuff on Instagram and YouTube also under Alada Malata. Those are my baby channels I'm just working on growing. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us today. I, I really do appreciate it. I hope we get to talk again sometime soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. So that was Julia Mallott. And yes, yeah, she writes uh, in the National Post and she speaks on other things as well, which I appreciated. Healthcare, uh, you know, issues in general. There's, there's much more to it than just the trans issue, of course, and it's all worth reading and listening to. And uh, one, one of the elements uh, Julia was talking about in a video was uh, access for her child to getting into to healthcare. I believe it was for uh, appendicitis. I mean, you know, th these are shared concerns parents have that the trans aspect has nothing to do with it. And so, you know, by all means, seek out Julia. Look at what she's talking about. There, there's uh, she's just a very good journalist out there, and, and it's appreciated. And like I said, we, we don't. Uh, at least speaking for myself, I don't understand these things. I had a, a straight and narrow course to know where I was going when I grew, but not everybody is like that. And we're getting better. We've got a lot more work to do on it. But the more we can talk about things, the more we can hopefully try to figure them out. And I, I really liked that recent uh, video uh, from Julia down in Florida. As I said, the Americans do have a different outlook on things. There's a story I tell often about because I, I went into quite a bit of a culture shock quite some years ago when I worked down in Texas. Uh, and I love Texas, but there's, they're also, yeah, very blunt speaking and no, not necessarily always tolerant. But there was a place I worked at near Grossbeck, Texas. It's out by uh, uh, Waco. And uh, there was a, a, a limestone lake and there's a, a facility on there called the Rainbow Ranch. And it's what you'd think it would be. And this is quite some years ago. And this is in Texas. And you got the rainbow flags. And yes, it was a, a, a campground and, and sort of small resort for LGBTQ people to get together and, and have a good time and everything. And I was doing my survey work and talking to a neighbor. And he was just a classic Yosemite Sam looking Texan guy with a thick accent and the hat and the snake boots on. And he said a few things about, uh, I guess, the 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 sexuality of his neighbors at that ranch. But then in the same out handful of uh, words, he also said, but if anybody ever messes with them, they're going to go through me because those are my neighbors. That's some of the Texan attitude I really loved. I mean, he, it's, it's along the lines of, I disagree with everything they do. Okay, I'd rather you didn't disagree, but so be it. But hey, they have every right to do whatever the heck they're doing over there and you leave them alone because that's their place. That's their business. Now, as I said, it, this is where we start getting more complex when it comes to trans issues. I think most of society has come you know, far along with LGBTQ issues, particularly when it's adults. It's when children are involved that we start worrying. We start getting concerned, again, because as we know, uh, childhood's a confusing time. It's, uh, we, we can make some pretty bad decisions in childhood, everything from where you might stick a firecracker to, uh, you know, if I was allowed to get tattoos, I'd probably have had a giant one across my chest when I was 17 or something. So, I mean... We just have to take care. And I don't think, uh, as Julia said, this conversation is going to go on for quite a while. There's no doubt about it. But I, I think the fact that it's been brought out on the table and uh, some lines were drawn and now we can start talking about it. That's one of the things Premier Smith did, even if you don't agree with every part of her, her legislation, if you think it didn't go far enough or it goes too far, at least we're talking about it because it's very important to a lot of people in the schools, to the teachers, to the students, to the parents. And I am getting frustrated, though, and I think that's where a big line was crossed. A lot of activists saying parents don't have rights. Yes, they do, guys. I mean, some of that speech recently, parents don't have rights, they have responsibilities. Well, you can't have responsibilities unless you have the right to do something about it. If you're kept in the dark, how can you be held responsible? So no, guys, it, it's not as simple as that. It's not as simple as saying parents don't have rights. Of course they have rights. And it doesn't mean a parent has a right to be abusive. Those Households exist, but we do have legislation that exists for abusive parents as well. I mean, it, most parents, most parents by far have the best interest of their children at heart, and they should be in on the conversation. But uh, yeah, sometimes it, it, it could be bad. Uh, 
It's, it's nothing's cut and dry and necessarily that easy. Okay, uh, let's see. I'll cover a few other things as we uh, go through the news on the show today, too. Here's another area. This is coming from uh, the housing minister in a recent report, uh, Sean Fraser, saying that all Canadians share a moral failure for homelessness. Uh, and he, he promised a response to the federal report. Uh, where, you know, tent cities have been torn down. And there was some housing bureaucrat who came out with a report saying that it's a human right and that it was wrong to tear down the tent cities in Edmonton and places like that. Come on, it's getting ridiculous. And the main thing that still drives me bananas, and I go on about this on the show quite often, is they won't admit where the problem is 99% of the time, or 90% fine if I'm going to throw numbers out there. But seriously, mental health and drug addiction, which are often intertwined. Most of the addicts out on the streets are, or most of the homeless people on the streets are addicts. Let's quit pussyfooting around it because they start talking, oh, it's a lack of affordable housing. It's a a lack of social housing. It's a lack of this. Look, those are elements once a person gets cleaned up, if they get cleaned up, that they will need a home and they'll need to be affordable. But that's not what's putting them on the streets. Let's quit pretending that. If we aren't going to outright talk about why they're there in the first place, you're not going to get them off of there. Do you really think the guy pushing the shopping cart down the street with crap running down his leg, talking to the clouds, smoking a meth pipe, is ready for a home? This is a person who really needs help. Absolutely. It's tragic to think of that person trying to live out there when it's minus 30, when they're that debilitated. But it's not a matter of high rent that is keeping. How low would rent have to get? Do you think if rent was $100 a month, that person would be living fine and in a household? Of course not, because the problem isn't just the rent. That's at best just an aspect of it. But we don't talk about that. We need treatment, and treatment's difficult. It's expensive. It's time-consuming. It's not always successful. But if you don't treat the addicts out there, they're not going to be housed, not successfully. I was at... uh, the, the, the signing uh, event, the kickoff one for the petition for Jody Gondek uh, down at City Hall last weekend. And there was, by the way, hundreds and hundreds of people came out to, to sign, despite legacy media putting out reports saying it was 100. Uh, same old crap out of the legacy media. So uh, either way, while I was out there, I mean, City Hall area, they actually pushed the whole thing to the other side of City Hall. It's funny, they don't do that when the anti-Jew protests come. They just let them stand out in front of City Hall. But Gondek... Calgary's mayor has kind of let her thoughts on Jews slip pretty clearly already. So I guess we could see that. But either way, hidden away back behind City Hall, it's pretty rough by the library. There's a lot of addicts and a lot of uh, troubled souls back there. And I I ran across uh, Calgary columnist Rick Bell, and we were chattering, and and we walked back to the parking area together. And then, of course, we're just standing there chatting for another 20 minutes or so. And there was a gentleman sitting on the steps behind us. He had a glass pipe, and about three different times he just packed it up and huffed who knows what, and he would just nod off again. And then after a little bit, he would get up and he'd pack some more and smoke. He wasn't trying to hide it. I, you know, getting in there and arresting him for that, no, that's not going to do any favors necessarily either. I mean, I think we, it's time to get some intervention once people hit the street level with addiction and that. But, I mean, to criminalize, to say the man's a criminal, I mean, you know, he might f- steal things to f- feed his habit, who knows, but uh, that's not the right approach. But also still... Um, um, you know, pretending that, uh, uh, you know, that this person just needs a a lower rent or home is is just uh, uh, absurd. Oh, I see. I got a commenter whining about, you know, slandering people protesting Israeli genocide. Okay. There's no genocide. Get over it. They're defending themselves. I don't care about Hamas numbers. You know, I will respond to commenters. I don't care about your lying numbers from Hamas about how much the children have been uh, attacked. Hamas is responsible. Hamas. And it's anti-Semitism. The anti-Jewish jerks were protesting at Mount Sinai Hospital the other day. It's not anti-Israeli, that's anti-Jew. And you're thinly varnished BS pretending, oh, I'm just critical of Israel. Oh, spare me. You hate Jews. And it's really come out these days. And yes, I will call it out. You say blocking people for disagreeing? No, I block losers with their anti-Jewish stuff. So get used to it. It's not going to stop. Either way, that's part of that discussion. So either way, housing is another big one coming up, though. So the tent cities, you know, is, is it's a, a human right to have a tent city, a human right to keep that there? No, it's not. It's dangerous. It, these cities burn down. People overdose in them. There's high crime in them. They, when the police have moved in on them, they found weapons. They found guns. 
they found in Calgary loads of money in some of them. So, yes, we have uh, issues going on, and it's not a human right. What about the right of the person who lives next to the tent city? What about the right of the person with a business next to the tent city? So what is Susie Saluk saying, here in Alaska, here in Alaska uh, we drive them crazy via a marathon between shelters and prison, uh, chasing money with uh, our little no good addicted and crazy selves. I'm not sure. I, I, Susie, your, your com uh, comment is appreciated, but a little incoherent. But then you said, fact, your show. So I guess you don't really want discussion on it. Um, so, uh, again, uh, yes, there's a, there is a cycle between prison and uh, homeless shelters. That I agree. So maybe it's time to have facilities built back to institutions for people with mental health issues, institutions for people who need inpatient addiction treatment. We went away from that. We went to this community living idiocy, and it's not working. It's failing. And this enablement cult, and that's what it is. It's a cult. It doesn't matter what comes up. They keep saying, we just need to enable harder. We saw that with Bonnie Henry, the, the health authority in British Columbia. BC has had now uh, free and legal hard drugs for, they've been handing out for, for a year. And what happened? Overdoses have shot through the roof. It's gotten worse. Every person with a grain of common sense said that was going to happen. And lo and behold, it happened. So how she responded? She was on a press conference the other day saying, we need to make sure to get more heroin to those people on the streets. Yes, free heroin. Because they go with this BS. You know, they won't use the word overdose anymore. They use drug toxicity. They say, you know, we need safer supply. It's, it's supposedly a matter of the, the drugs being contaminated with something. Guys, heroin in its most pure form will kill you pretty fast. It's pretty toxic. There's no safe meth you can take. You can overdose on that stuff too. And uh, it, it's just uh, it tiresome, you know. <laughs> It's, it's not working. But when you get to the point of, of that sort of discussion, we're not going to get there. Uh, same sort of thing. Here's another myth going on. You know, antitrust promise uh, was ridiculed. Yeah, the Antitrust Competition Bureau yesterday was uh, said they're committed to fighting mergers within the grocery trade. You know, I, I had the, the food professor on a little while ago, Sylvain Charlebois. That's his specialty. He talks about these issues. I mean, we've been talking, people have been trying to make the case that grocery retailers are gouging Canadians and citizens. They've been claiming that for years. And every time it's studied, it's found, no, their margins are like 3 to 5%. They aren't gouging. They're as low as they can get. One of the few things that I, Charlebois kind of agreed on is we could use some more competition. Okay, fair enough. That won't hurt. But when we've got a government that does nothing but constantly attack the grocers, that attacks business, that hikes taxes, and uh, messes directly with mergers and things like that, what new grocery business, large grocery business, uh, is going to move into Canada? Why would you want to move into that for a 4 to 5% margin business as it is? They're not going to. Guys, government isn't the solution. It's the problem. And that it can be applied to many, many, many things all the time. Speaking of which, yes, Gil Bo, there's the beauty. Like I said, you know, he, he wants to uh, end, uh, you know, or reduce the amount of, of roadways being built so people will stop driving. It's, he's nuts. He's nuts. But we got civic leaders like Jody Gondek, who's nutty enough to follow up on him. So we got to take his stuff seriously, unfortunately. You know, 15-minute cities, not as much of a conspiracy as it sounds like. It's just that the, the way they're going to go about keeping you contained. But, you know, the senior political people won't be contained. They'll still fly over the world. They'll still vacation in tropical places. They just want you to cut back. You tighten your belt. You have a smaller house. You don't have a lawn. You don't have a car because you've got to save the world. But they're so important, they got to be able to go around and do all those things without you. All right, I'll finish with one more thing. The Super Bowl, I watched it. I had to bet on one team or another just to keep interest because I'm really indifferent between Kansas and San Francisco. My Steelers, they didn't make it there this year. They weren't worthy of it. Fair enough. But all the discussion with Taylor Swift. So what? So what? I Hey, if it's bringing new eyes on the game, good on them. I mean, they, they cut away to her like four or five times throughout the game, maybe 10 or 12 times. I don't know. It's a long game. I don't care. It didn't hurt the game. It didn't harm it. But then I saw some of the, the looniness that came out. There was some weird woman that came with Taylor Swift Swift, and she had a, a, a crucifix on that some people said was upside down. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. And then she was doing some sort of uh, hand uh, um, signals, and suddenly they were popping up. She's doing Satanist symbols on there, and this is Satanism out in the open. I mean, what? 
Are you guys crazy? This is the sort of thing that if you remember in the 80s, they were pulling in uh, Frank Zappa and Ozzy Osbourne and Twisted Sister before committees and talking about the guys, come on, lighten up, okay? I don't think uh, Taylor Swift and the rest are going to be spreading crazy Satanism around. Uh, it's just beyond the, the pale these days. But uh, either way, I enjoyed the spectacle, the Super Bowl. I mean, it's also a celebration of capitalism. It's a celebration of high-level athleticism, even if you don't like the political stances of some of the owners and the players. You know, as I said online, too, once in a while, I just want a break. I want something non-political for a bit. And I got that. I'm going to be counting down the days until the football season starts again. All right. Well, we covered quite a bit today, guys. Thank you for tuning in. I do appreciate it. And, uh, be sure to tune in, you know, subscribe to the standard, tune into the channels. There's all sorts of stuff coming out all the time. And uh, the pipeline will be on a little later. We'll dissect a few more issues with a panel. And uh, yeah, lots going on, guys. Lots to discuss. We'll find the solutions to all of those issues eventually. Thanks for coming on, and I'll see you next week at this time. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long long ago these guys are on the front lines uh, helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in canada and more importantly educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people you become a member it's absolutely worth every penny